Hi, I'm David Anderson, and this is the Timex Sinclair Online User Group. We meet on the first Monday and the third Sunday of each month. You can find out more about our group and sign up for email notices <clears throat> at timexsinclair.com. We also have an email list at groups.io. You can find a link to that at timexsinclair.com. Sometimes we have special guests or topics. Sometimes it's open chat. Tonight, Tim Swenson is going to tell us about his Timex adventures and the newsletters he's published over the years. A link to his website is below in the description, along with links to other topics we discussed tonight. And <clears throat> I'm hoping to have some updates from Neil about his Larkin RAM disk experiences. So Tim's Sinclair journey began with a CX81 that he purchased in November of 1981 during his senior year of high school. Tim, that reveals your age, you know. <clears throat> um, yep. He used it. <laughs> <laughs> during his first year of college. When it had problems, he replaced it with a Timex Sinclair 1000. He bought the 2068 soon after it came out, but the SCLD chip died about six months later. Tim upgraded to a QL in April of 86 and used it as his main system until about 2000. He added a gold card, a ROM disk, ED drives, and a keyboard interface and now he's 100% uh, on emulators for all of his Sinclair systems. On the professional side, Tim was an Air Force officer from 1988 to 96. He was at Laughlin Air Force Base, the Pentagon, Keesler Air Force Base, and Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. He returned to California and started working in Silicon Valley with SGI, Legato, EMC, OnStore, LSI, Exablox, Storage Craft and ArcSurf. Did I get all that right, Tim? Yep, you did. Okay, I'm going to turn it over to you. <laughs> Gee, where'd you get all that great information? <laughs> <No>. <laughs> all right. So I want to talk. I was basically I was asked to talk about the various newsletters I've done over the years. Um, it all started. Uh, I got the QL. Uh, I learned there was a uh, local uh, user group in uh, Burlingame. And they were, there were the three user groups. There was the East Bay, a Peninsula, and a South Bay. They all joined together to do timelines as a newsletter. So I started doing a few short programs, wrote an article about the program, and turned it into the newsletter. And that's kind of how I got started. Um, when I was out in the, at the Pentagon, I was a member of the uh, Capital Area Timex Sinclair User Group, better known as CATS, uh, and kind of got volunteered to be their newsletter editor when the last one left. So um, besides doing the editing, it was like, you know, collect articles, write something myself, and then doing all the layout and then passing it on to someone else to have it printed. Um, so that got me more into writing. Uh, I also felt that kind of like, when you start writing code, you're sort of writing in a way. So I start writing code, then writing articles about the code and then just write articles. Um, after CATS, um, so actually while doing the CATS newsletter, I was realizing that there were certain subjects that I wanted to talk about, but they weren't really appropriate for the newsletter. There are more, I've got a bachelor's degree in computer science, so more on that side than the typical user group stuff. So I started what's called the QL Hackers Journal, which is basically a free newsletter for discussing programming on the QL. You know, the language covered it all. I had a few people provide articles, most of my writing. I did that for 10 years. Uh, I didn't charge for it because I was worried. I saw so many other newsletters where people would subscribe to, and then two months later, they'd be dead. So I wanted to go through that. So I just basically would print out about 30 copies. Um, they were basically the size of a half sheet of paper, you know, uh, print them out, 30 copies, mail them out, and then start doing the email. And then after a while, the email list got larger than the actual mailing list. That lasted about 10 years. Um, and of course, when I, came, when I came back to California, there were really any, any user groups anymore. So I just sort of fell out of doing things. Um, was it five or six years ago? Maybe just a touch longer. I'm like, I felt the urge to work more on, the, on them, all of the machines and then write articles, but there was no place for them. Kind of the newsletters were kind of gone. So oh, don't worry about the phone. Uh, so basically, I started uh, SMSQ Zine, and then I started ZX Zine, SMSQ Zine for the QL, and ZX Zine for initially the ZX81, 
and then the 2068 is I kind of got into it a bit more. Um, and those have been fun. Uh, I had done some desktop publishing. I learned Scribus probably about 2006 doing another e-zine. And so doing the, the other two new, the two or newer e-zines e was easier. I knew how to do the desktop publishing. Um, kind of want to make them look a little nicer than just a text document. So all the front cover with a nice big picture. Um, add add text in two columns, add some uh, photographs in. Um, if it's long code, don't publish it, put it as a zip file. So every issue came with a zip file, which came with the binaries, with the code, everything from the articles. So there's no layout issues. Some shorter articles, excuse me, some shorter code might be published as an example, but all still be in the zip file. So, and the idea I got also was to make it look nice. Uh, so Scribus was what a tool I was using. It's a nice desktop publishing tool, it's free. Of course, it's open, it's a, created with a Creative Commons license. All the tools I use are, are open source between the emulators, the word processor, the desktop publishing, get this, uh, and, and so on. So I've been doing, um, again, didn't, didn't charge for it, of course, because I wasn't sure when I came out with articles, sometimes, I mean, issues, Sometimes I go a year between issues. It's all a matter of what I produce. If I'm working a lot, I'll generate a lot. If not, I don't do much. So I think I've got seven or eight issues per uh, per zine out right now. So that's kind of roughly what I want to talk about. If I'm, I'm looking for questions. So Tim, you uh, you mentioned that you started with timelines and I have seen a few issues of timelines that I think was one of the more, just in terms of formatting, there, there were some really long issues, physically long, like eight and a half by 14, I think, right? Yeah, they're all eight and a half by 14. I've got yeah. a binder uh, in the garage of a number of years worth. So oh, I got wow. okay. it got scanned in. Okay, okay. It's my to-do okay. list. <laughs> well, but so that, that's the thing is, you know, uh, the, the timelines that I have seen are really great in terms of, you know, there's this sort of broad spectrum of, of newsletters and the timelines right. were at the nicer end, you know, in terms of the content and, and the, some of them actually had, you know, real ads versus some of the others. <laughs> um, so that was when you, when was that? Was that like roughly 82, 83? No, that would have been more like 86, 87. Oh, okay. I got the I got the QL in eighty six, April of eighty six. Uh, when I bought my QL, it was a debate: get a QL, get a hang glider, get a QL, get a hang glider. <laughs> I went with the QL. Well, clearly you made the right decision. I had worked, <laughs> I had worked out a deal with a local hang glider shop that uh, I did some programming work for them, so they're going to give me free training if I bought the hang glider. Yeah. But then again, I'm glad I bought the QL. <laughs> it lasted much much longer. Um, but no, that would have been 86, 87, just as I was in um, senior year, junior, senior year of uh, college, and then a little after that. I remember going over to the Burlingame Peninsula Hospital in Burlingame, which is where we had the meetings. And um, I did see Jack Dehaney, the merry toy maker there. Yeah. Uh, George Mockridge, I think, was our president. So we had some people with 2068s and the Waffa Drive, I think, was one. Oh, yeah. The, the, um, like the Rotronics, uh, but the what they imported it yeah the imported that. yeah yeah um don't remember much other than just having a general meeting and talking and seeing the waffle drive and kind of be amazed because i really hadn't seen one before um neil wants to know if timelines was also if they also had a bulletin board system i don't think they did I'm, i don't recall them having one okay. i know that the cats group capital every time they had a bulletin board running out of a K Pro 10. Oh my God, which, you're kidding. Uh, it worked fairly well until the modem died, which allowed more than five volts to come across the serial cable yeah. to the K Pro, which then blew the UART chip. Oh, literally wow. blew it. You know, you open it up and there's a little hole, a, a chip taken out of the UART chip. Oh my God. Because of too much voltage. Uh, but I think they got that fixed. But uh, I don't remember times lines having a bulletin board it might have later again i left uh march of 88 left california so they might have had one later okay and so 
when when did you do the cats thing when were you in in that would have been like 89 90 91 ish okay i left there in 92 so somewhere about in fact i remember one of the article i was rereading it and i got married in 1990 and i think i had an issue due before i got flew back out to california to get married so i basically had it done a couple weeks early to be able to get (laughs) to bed to the printer and i can then go back to come back to california to get married here. so are you, are you saying that your wife wouldn't have appreciated you working on a newsletter on the honeymoon is that what you're saying <laughs> <laughs> probably not we I mean, were both set we were, we were both in virginia but all our family was in california so she flew out early to make the other arrangements here and i then flew out but yeah i don't think she would have um i don't know if you see the chat uh, jeff was asking what what was the user experience on the ql like Oh, um, to be quite honest, I really liked it. Once I got to floppies, it was great. Microdrive, I had some issues. In fact, I remember writing a paper. Uh, I, it's due in a day or two, and my copy of Quill dies. Bad sectors. So I call over to Sensor Electronics and say, hey, how fast can I get a Quill drive? Oh, is anybody near me? And there's a gentleman by the name of Robert Fingerly, who wrote hmm. software for the ZX81 and the QL. He did Concept 3D. 3D. Hmm. He says, oh, Robert's in Fremont. Here's his number. Give him a call. So I called Robert. He's less than a mile away. And he's like, oh, yeah, I got a spare quill. Come on by, pick it up. <laughs> then he showed me the demos for Concept 3D, all written in basic and then compiled. Oh, wow. So I, I ran that quill for a while. Then eventually I got onto floppies, five and a quarter, then three and a half, so then EDs. EDs were great. They're like mini hard drives. You can put tons of stuff. Uh, I got a ROM disk. So I actually also bought the original monitor with the QL. So that was a great monitor. Perfect. You know, I remember the Commodore monitors when you, the black was kind of a gray, mm-hmm. but on the QL monitor, black was black. No matter how much you cranked up the brightness, black stayed black. So it was a great monitor. So I did a lot with that, with the QL. Um, had a variety of printers. Uh, uh, inkjet okay, printer, can we can we back up one second tim so when you, when you first said you were using the monitor I, I i was thinking you meant a machine language monitor but so no, no, there no. was there was actually a monitor for especially for the ql so there was, what, it was called Claire? the ql vision monitor there was a ql printer and there was a ql itself all labeled with sinclair ql uh oh. the ql printer was a relabeled shikosha 1000 i think um at the time I bought them, each was $300, 300 for the monitor, 300 for the printer, 300 for the QL. But you buy all three together, you get a discount of 850 So I bought all three together. Oh, someone did find the timelines, BBS. All right. Which I, I, I didn't have a modem at the time. My first modem was a acoustic. I only had a princess style uh, headset, handset. Do you remember the princess phone? Yes. Which was smooth. It so wouldn't fit. Every, it worked until I sneezed. <laughs> it would log off. Yeah. So I'd make sure it's really quiet because I can hear the conversation going on because I was kind of setting it there. But if it was if I was too noisy or sneezed or something, it would just disconnect. Mm. That's so funny. <clears throat> so um Robert also wrote a word processor for the 1000 and the 2068. Yeah. yeah I don't great. know about the 2068 when I've seen the ads of for the 1000, but he yeah. might have done the 2068. Yeah. He passed away six, seven, eight years ago. And uh-huh. before he passed away, I was able to send him an email and get uh, his permission to release Concept 3D as basically a public domain. Hey, oh, cool. here's the manual. Here's the software. Make it available. Cool. So we had the software somewhere, and then someone's had a manual. So I merged the two together, and now they're both available. Not use it myself, uh, but it is out there and something to try. It was one of the there were two 3D programs for uh, the QL Concept 3D, and I can't remember the name of the other one right off. Oh, you mean besides uh, his? Yeah. So there was the Concept 3D was Roberts. Yeah, and there's one more. Was it that was it was the an upgrade idea. of the Scion one that was released for the 2068? No, no, no. There no? was that they Scion only did the th- the four major programs for the QL, and that was really it, I think. 
So they might, oh, yeah, I think that was pretty much it. And Cyan did actually release Quill, Abacus, Archive, and uh, and Exchange. No, the, the, at least the four set for the PC. And that actually got fairly popular, moderately speaking, in the UK. I wonder if it was Cam Master as a CAD program. No, this is. That was, I think that's the US one. There was one in Britain. Okay. Okay. Called. Well, there was, yeah, there's a ton of Britain. something. Ton of, ton of software in Britain for the, the QL. Um, yeah. yeah. In fact, almost everything you bought through uh, major suppliers, we'll see Curry Computers in Arizona. I bought things through them. And Sunset Electronics in San Francisco did carry some things, not a lot. Yeah. So I remember when I bought the QL, I did buy. QL Caverns as a game. That was my first piece of software. Uh, I did buy Metacomco Pascal. Oh. I had to buy then I then I had to buy extra memory to get it to run what I wanted to run because I couldn't run uh, the compiler plus the program in 128k. So I had to get that 512 expander. But then um, I couldn't I'll buy a 512 expander, floppy interface, and then I couldn't afford floppy drives. So what was the gold card? Gold card is a replacement for the 68,000. I think it has a 6810. It includes a floppy interface and it includes memory. I can't remember how much memory it includes. Okay. But it replaced anything that was on the expansion card on the left. The gold card pretty much replaced. Put whatever you had there in, in memory interface. It also had a parallel printer interface too, I think, on the gold card. Oh. And it was faster. So it, it, would, it would give you a newer CPU and run much, much faster. So it's really, really nice. So the QL expanded out to the left? Right, so as you looked at it, uh, to the right was where you could expand microdies, but no one ever did. I don't think it really made them for the QL. On the left was the expansion for the, had the bus where you put all the, you'd stack up your different things. Huh. So I put the memory interface first and then add to that the, the floppy interface and the floppy cables came out. Oh, okay. And what got to about the point where so, so someone sent me a freebie, a um, keyboard interface. So I basically took the QL, put it under the monitor with a table. My floppies were in a separate little box. Um, <laughs> so my keyboard is separate. So the QL is kind of hidden away. Never used the micro drives. And I once went to floppy. Oh, wow. Uh, what did the ROM disk do for you? Uh, like a USB thumb drive. It fit oh. in the ROM port and it was a hard drive. Oh, crazy. Okay. Oh. Uh, and um, that became then. So, as you know, the QL just boots up the ROM. Yeah. Uh, and the concept of a boot program came into play when you started adding different uh, toolkits. You wanted toolkit two, you wanted this, you wanted the pointer environment, you wanted. So, everyone wrote their own boot program. So, I had everything booting off of the ROM disk, which was incredibly fast. So it would normally take, you know, maybe a minute or two to boot off of floppy, but ROM just booted up almost instantly. So that was really kind of so nice. So were you able to burn your own EEPROM to make whatever you wanted on that ROM desk? No, it was, again, it's a thumb drive. Oh, so it, you would write to it, you could delete files. It was just like you would use now a thumb drive. It was flash ROM, flash oh. RAM, or ROM, you know. Hmm. So it functioned as a USB, we would now use a USB thumb drive. And this was what era then? This was the probably got uh, 94, 95, probably. Okay. Oh, okay. Wow. Um, yeah, because I think I meant, yeah, it came out before. So Miracle Systems made it. They were working on the masterpiece um, video card that was extra video for the QL to expand it. Uh, I won that as a door prize. Uh, at the QL show in Tennessee in 1996. And, to, and it was a project that never came out. So basically, <laughs> I think it was 21st, no, Stuart Honeyball <clears throat> said, well, I have this one you want, you have to debug it. <laughs> it wasn't quite working, right? So I never got it because it never came out. So, and you also, were you somehow involved in some of the user group? um gatherings the like the midwest um sinclair group or, or was it just the bbqs so, afterwards just the stuff afterwards uh so there was a gentleman by the name of gary ganger who 
But basically, the big event was uh, the Ham Benchmark. I think it was our computer fest. No, it's computer fest. And all the Sinclair folks would come to that. And Gary Ganger ran uh, the D Dayton Microcomputer Association, DMA, ran the event. Gary was a leader of one of the subgroups, including the computer museum, which is basically Gary's computer collection. And so I would help him man the booth for that during the day. Then I would host barbecues at my house. Uh, I've been to one year I went to it, we had a restaurant, I couldn't meet anybody. So when I moved to Dayton, my goal was to meet people. So I used basically, hey, come on to my house, free burgers, free soda. Gary donated the sodas. I paid for the burgers. I rented chairs from, from MWR. And we probably had 30 people at my house. And I went and bought some burgers fairly cheap and figured it was just one of the costs of, uh, of the hobby and hosted it. So, um, so, so you'll do that, uh, what, like next summer, this coming summer, right? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, the last time there was a QL show in the, uh, and in the West Coast was, I want to say 1998 or 1999. There's one on the West Coast. We actually had, uh, East Coast, we had a West Coast one. And I hosted people at my house that evening also. <laughs> so uh, I've got a picture, I think, of Simon Goodwin. Everyone know who, who he is? <laughs> Oh, okay. He wrote Supercharge and Turbo. Um, also, uh, who else was in there? Tony Fershman was there and Stuart Honeyball. And I got a picture of myself and two of those guys in my hot tub. So, <laughs> and Simon stayed at my house for a couple of days during that, that event. So, so, so sort of like Celebrity Hot Tub. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, Marcel Kilgus was here who wrote um, uh, the UP, QP, QPC one and two he's still around and uh i don't think he's joined any of our meetings but he has joined the ql meetings oh very um, cool, very cool. Had, so, oh uh, Tim. anybody here remember stan kelly boodle mm -mm. he he his fame his fame is first computer science major in the u in the uk ever in the world hmm. um he also wrote for a number of uh magazines so look him up he was at the ql show here i got online talking to him online mentioned the show when he actually came and visited. Oh, that's awesome. And I've got a book of his where he brought to the show for me and signed it. That's awesome. I'm gonna, Dave Spinett apparently knows a little bit about QLs because he keeps chiming in in the chat. <clears throat> so I'm gonna ask him to chime in on mic if he doesn't mind. <laughs> Guys, I've, uh, can you hear me okay? Mm-hmm. I, I've uh, lurked on your chats a couple times before. Um, uh, if you don't mind a, a brief intro, um, I have my first computer was a TS one thousand in I want to say eighty one, and uh, wanted to, wanted to play games, of course, and couldn't do it. So me and a buddy uh, started writing in hand coded machine language, you know, con converting text and whatever, and then we dropped it, of course, and got a life in between, but. You know, those Sinclairs gave us both an IT career. We're both still in IT, you know, whatever this 30, 40 years later. And we're starting to write assembly games in high res for the uh, TS-1000 again. So we wrote, uh, well, our, we're now doing high res. The last one we did was a Donkey Kong remake of our own of our own creation, which we posted out in the forums. But yeah, since then, we've bought the entire collection. I always wanted a Spectrum. And of course, they never sold them here in the States. And uh, I had a 2068 was my second computer. And uh, I gave that to my best friend uh, at that time when I went to Atari 520, 1040, and TT. And then when we started getting back into it, he tells me he still got my original TS-2068, including the uh, Spectrum ROM uh, that uh, oh, you could put in play Specky games, which was you know pretty rare for a factory accessory. So he got that. So he bought me another TS-2068. So we've got those. Plus, we have all the Sinclair. I, I was holding up my QL. I was proud of that. When these came out, I wanted one so bad, but of course there was no way with my funding and age that that was ever going to happen. So, uh, you know, we got the retro bug and we've got all the Spectrum models, at least the Sinclair ones. Uh, he's got the Amstrad ones too. I just have the Sinclair ones, but 
Um, any case, yeah, the um, the QL um, uh, Marcel uh, was mentioned. He uh, makes a, a VGA adapter, so I got that. Um, my buddy and I we made our own power supply, and I designed a, a matching 3D printed case to go with it. It's also universal power supply, so you can plug any of the Sinclair things to it with its own lead, and it'll power them all. So we can just have one power brick instead of you know seven or eight of them. Um, Dave, you were saying I, that the gold cards and upgraded toolkits on rom are still available yeah the uh toolkit rom i got off ebay i think it was uh. a guy in germany and i mean they're brand new i mean they're still doing it um and i uh, i think i paid seven bucks shipped to the u.s for wow. toolkit 2.1 and i just popped out the old roms and popped in the new one and that was it it was super simple what, what's uh, the Marcel toolkit what is that what's that? what is the oh. toolkit yeah, well it's like your boot rom kind of thing for oh, oh so Toolkit is so when the QL came out, it was a little too early. So I kept having different <laughs> ROMs. And so when they finalized the last ROM, there was a lot of extra features that Tony Tebby wanted. So he created QView as a company and then basically uh, wrote these extra commands and features that you can either have in. A, I had it initially on my floppy interface, the Toolkit or Toolkit 2. And then you can get as ROMs or you can get Toolkit 2 as uh, software and just load it into memory. A lot of, so the QL had the ability to take binary code and make more commands out of it that look just like a, a command in a ROM because your names, your table space was in RAM. So you can then have what's in ROM and then add additional to it. So any procedure you wrote goes into the namespace, including binary stuff. Huh. So Toolkit 2 was real popular, almost mandatory. And then you started getting things like the pointer environment. It gave you a, a nice, wonderful GUI. Oh, that's right. I remember reading something about um, um, somebody called it an ICE. Icon. ICE was another GUI that was yeah. in uh, uh, Prom. I had ICE, too. Oh, very good. It wasn't cool. that great. It wasn't as nice as Toolkit, but it was very, but, I mean, nice as pointer environment, but it was very early. Yeah. Interesting. W wasn't there a was there a Mac emulator ROM, or was it vice versa that there was a Spectrum emulator on the Mac? I mean, a QL emulator on the Mac. I know there was a QL emulator on the Atari ST very early. Okay. I think that's how uh, one guy in Virginia used it, and I want to say Jochen Mers in the UK was a big Atari guy and a QL guy. I think he used the emulator on the Stacy, Atari Stacy, I think was his thing. Oh. That we, and Stacy, I think was like a laptop or portable mm -hmm. Atari. Mm -hmm. so you can make the, take it on the go and still use the QL part too. Oh, very cool. Very cool. So are you, are you going to now get out a, a real hard, you know, real QL and start using it again? <laughs> Me? No, I'm, I'm pure hot emulator. I've got some hardware outside. I don't want to go through the trouble of it breaking or anything like that. So emulators is just 100% for me. <laughs> well, a, you, don't I, have to, you don't have to worry about the crazy keyboard too. Right. Yeah. On my, so on my little netbook, uh, I can run QL, all QL, ZX81, Spectrum 2068, and others, whatever I want on yeah. a little 11 inch netbook. So, and what's the QL emulator that you use? Primarily SMS Q, SMS Q, SMS Q, Q emulator. I think it's how it's pronounced. It's tough to pronounce. Okay. It's uh, Java based, but it's free. Uh, QPC2 is now free, but it used to be commercial. There's also um, SQLX, which is a basically uh, uh, um, written in C and ported to different environments, mostly to Linux. Oh, wow. It uses okay. the SDL. Uh, um, framework and um, for this graphics right the, the sdl library yeah um and what do you what do you use your emulators to do i think someone was mentioned a while back some of interesting. if i'm going to write anything of any length for hobbies i write under quill really i want a black background i want so i can just take my netbook sit in my recliner and right away quill works it's black background and i've got a program that'll convert from quill to rtf which then easily uploads into uh, mm -hmm. OpenOffice. It keeps all the formatting, and then I can do spell checking and everything else. Very cool. Uh, that and just programming stuff, and you know, I like to do. Yeah, yeah. Are you programming in Pascal or, or uh, C? It, or? 
varies C, basic, a little Pascal, no assembly on the QL, only on the ZX81 or 2068. <laughs> I tried ZX basic by Boreal on the, uh, so I did the convert to the 2068, had a problem, took my program, ran it under the Spectrum version. There's a bug in ZX basic. So even the Spectrum version has a bug. So, Wait. oh, okay. Interesting. Interesting. So I was looking at that and going, this would be great. That oh, darn, it's got a bug. Oh. <laughs> I tried to join their forum. It won't let me join because it sends out an email, uh, which I never got. Uh, it looks like it's starting to um, fade away. Some of the forum um, updates aren't fairly current. So Wh which forum is that? Uh, the ZX, the Boreal ZX basic forum. Oh, okay. On the, yeah, for his own forum. The, the issue seems to be with floating point numbers. Uh, do some calculations in the background, print out some floating point, and dies. Dies, dies? Oh, like... an emulator. Uh, good point. I should try. I only have one emulator for the Spectrum, so it could be that. Uh, 81, uh, I don't have, I think I might have, I might have, um, I was on running Linux, so 81 is, I have to make sure I have all the, the tools for it. Well, so. uh, you know, um, ZSARX is originally for Unix. That's, that's what I've been using for the Spectrum, the 2068. Okay. Yeah. I, the only other one I could have would be the Warievo because it runs under DOS, which I can run under DOS box. Yeah. I might well, try that one to see how if either was Warievo. Yeah, it does both Spectrum and 2068. Right. So so there's a there's a DOS uh, emulator still being supported now? No, no, no. It's old. No. Uh, oh. Warievo came out in the early 90s. Uh, and I think it's been probably stopped supporting back in the late 90s. Okay. It just yeah. is still out there if it still works. So hmm. why not use it? Well, so I have some questions for you, Tim, uh, going back to your newsletter days in the 80s. Um, so you, you kind of seem to have had like been the center of a communication hub almost since you had several of these newsletters about how much like uh, mail and stuff were you getting from people like, and you were doing it all through mail communication, right? Or were you using BBSs? Uh, no, mostly mail or email. So while at the Pentagon, I had an email address. Uh, this would have been like 89. Uh, so I found other people's internet addresses and started talking to them overseas. Um, some in person. Uh, I mean, Herb Schaff gave me articles to write, and he was local. He would join. He was part of the cast group in the in the uh, early '90s. Uh, the folks I know from the Berlin game in the late '80s was local. So um, not so much BBS either in person or later by email, mostly. Uh, a few people in mail, but not a whole lot. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, when I used to have my newsletter in the early to mid '90s, which was not it's Sinclair related at all, um, it was I did a lot of communication through um, mail, and it was, um, I mean, we also used the internet because, like, it, this was like I guess '96, '97 was when it was um, I had a, probably the most people. There were about 100 subscribers, and there was um, when we eventually I went online only in. 99 or something something like that and um i was like well the internet that's gonna put a, i would love to have, like make another paper newsletter again like that would be that'd be great but you ever think about doing that uh no because the cost is too much yeah and it's so easy to take something and i could take i think you printed out my newsletter and realized mm -hmm. how much Absolutely. ink it takes Yes, I know. Is... Also, you like the color black. So like I printed out the front cover and it was like all black. I'm like, Tim is using up all my toner. Well, the, design, the idea was to view it digitally and not to print it out. <laughs> uh, and a, it's a black computer. Well, at least the QL is and the ZX81. So uh, black's not. Uh, so yeah. Yeah. So I hadn't thought about going back to paper just because the it's I mean, you, I could take it, print it out, but it's just easy just to post it online, say PDF. If oh, you I really you. want to I kill your you. printer, you could print it out, but uh, just view it online. <laughs> and also, with it being online, uh, I think when I do it a PDF, you can cut and paste. You can take some text from the article, cut and paste, and of course, all of the code is online. So you don't worry about retyping it or it being mis misaligned in the code. And how I, you know, it's all right there. Just take it, download it. Uh, if there's a QL files, is going all everything's going to be zipped basically. So you, especially for the QL stuff, for the 
Other stuff, a .p file or a .tap file, just load it directly into your machine. Of course, if you've got real hardware, you know how to convert tap to audio to get it into a real machine. So well, I, I guess uh, going back also to these 1980s days and you were in the, in the group. So what was the penetration of the QL in, into the Timex meetings? I mean, was were you one of the only people who had them at the meetings or were there others? Like no, just no, the Timex there were meetings others. in general? Um, yeah. So the majority of the Timex meetings were people that were probably in their 40s or older. As at the time being my late 20s I was, or early 20s, I mean, I was one of the younger guys, but uh, a lot of people were, got into 2068, thought it was an interesting computer, and then stayed with it for a while. They weren't young and like, oh, I got to get the latest and Um, So Tim, Tim was, uh, was Tom Bent still involved in CATS when you were there? Yeah, and I think so. He didn't come all that often, but I remember seeing him come a few times. Yeah. I want so we did a white elephant Christmas thing, or was it a uh no? It was, I think it was actually an auction. I think Tom had some stuff he wanted auctioned. And one of the ones, I don't know who made it, but it was like a PC talker. You plug into the QL, you send text, and it had a text to voice converter that would sound sound variously very robotic and you oh. said philadelphia it would go philadelphia it didn't know how to pronounce the philadelphia part okay so um it's just off a serial port you plug it in the wall and i think i got like seven or eight bucks i heard from tom later i got a good deal <laughs> <laughs> well that was the cost of the chip <laughs> could have been yeah um, i wonder if i used the vortex chip because that was kind of popular in those days. Um, I, I still, I think I still have it. I'm not too sure if it's out in the garage, uh, or I may have given it away. But it was just plug it in. You had to only plug into one serial port because the QL serial ports are different. Mm -hmm. And then just set, open up, open a port to that serial port, and just start sending text out. Again, you had to know the phenomes or the right text to send for it to make the right pronunciation. So yeah. you had to figure that out of it because there came no instructions whatsoever. What was this in the in the early nineties ish? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So my bought, money's on uh, the these... the General Instruments SPO two fifty six then, which is was I left DC readily available from Radio Shack. Yes, yeah, so I don't yeah. know what's inside it. No, I don't know who made it. Um, it's just a white box with a you know a hole for a speaker. No, excuse me, a black box. Uh, a handmade serial cord coming out, <laughs> but it was fun to play with. Really neat at the time, I thought. Oh yeah, yeah, those are fun. <laughs> the other thing I remember was we had a uh, white elephant giveaway thing, and the idea was that the typical white elephant, where if you like, if you get something, but you like something better, you can go steal it from somebody else. And what I got was. It was a um, window from a, of a boat, you know, that can, can crack open, right? Uh, so it has a clear plastic window. Someone had put in some uh, um, honey puff or something like that. Honey puffs in there, and then cereal? put a, then put a, a vacuum cereal? behind it, so that held the the material there, right? So the question was, what is it? Huh. A computer joke. Think like a rebus. It's a computer joke. So what's the call a window on a on a boat? A, a porthole. A porthole. Right. So was a... And what did we put? What did he put inside it? The honey smacks. Cereal. Cereal. Oh my god. <laughs> Cereal port. Cereal port. Yes. <laughs> I still it's out, still out in the garage. I thought it was so neat. That I kept it this day. And the the mice haven't gotten to it. <laughs> no, they haven't. <laughs> That's good. That's excellent. <laughs> yeah. So every, everyone everyone likes the joke because it's so stupid. And it was a great giveaway. And he, so this guy that gave it away actually had a number of boats and had this spare running around. And it was like, hey, let's just have some fun. And to this day, it's still having fun. Does anybody else have any questions for uh, for Tim? Well, thank you, Tim. That was, <clears throat> that was really... Uh, Quite amusing, <laughs> even with the bad pun. <laughs> it wasn't that bad. It wasn't that bad. Um, so, 
some of you know that Neil um, Cohen in Florida has a whole bunch of stuff that he's trying to get working. And one of the things that he has is a Larkin RAM disk that it turns out was um, the connector was soldered backwards on it. <clears throat> and um, so he's got a friend who's a, you know, a electronics guy who's taking it apart and is going to try to reproduce it and um, put some kind of battery battery backup on it. I, I don't know if he's going to use the original um, static uh, RAM chips uh, because those were like, I think, if it was 256, it would, I think they would have been 16K RAM chips or maybe maybe 32K RAM chips. Oh yeah, it was 32K RAM chips because eight would make 256K. So um, Neil's friend is reverse engineering this thing, hopes to eventually make some uh, uh, circuit boards and maybe uh, we'll, we'll uh, somehow release them so that we can, those of us who wish to have a RAM disk for our 2068 <laughs> um, <clears throat> can, can get such a thing. Okay, so Neil says the battery will have a self-charging circuit where the original did not. So it's gonna have a, uh, some kind of rechargeable battery on it. And I, I think Neil said uh, possibly USB power charging. So that would be pretty nifty. Um, let me just see if Willie's still here with us. Willie, I want to talk to you about your, your custom version of uh, Profile 2068. <laughs> I'll try if you guys can hear me. Oh, yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. So so what did you, Okay. what was the customization? Was it to run it off a disk drive, off a Larkin disk or something? Yeah. Yeah, basically we just went in and converted a bunch of the, basic so that it would run off of a JLO disk system and added a couple extra uh, little tweaks here and there and things you could do with the JLO. So basically it would give you pretty much a, a much, much bigger database because it would allow you to swap out floppies to do some of the searches and stuff. We ran a couple of uh, pretty big uh, email, or not email, but address, um, databases on it uh, back when ISTUG was was running and they were swapping newsletters with everybody and stuff like that. So um, it was just one of them things. It was just a lot of fun to do. Oh, that's really cool. That's really cool. I, I had forgot all about it until Neil sent me a screenshot that he actually has the program. I don't even have the, the program anymore. It's been so long, but uh, I remember that once he showed me the screenshot, I thought, oh man, I forgot about that. <laughs> but, <laughs> right. Yeah, Neil sent me the screenshot and I said, oh, that's Willie. <laughs> yeah, it was way back in the day. Yeah. But, so, uh, so you guys. That's pretty much what it was. It was just converting it from a tape based system to the JLO disk this system. So. That's very cool. So, and for the folks who are not aware of this, there was, there was, you know, usually art, a whole sort of culture of articles about how to convert something that ran from tape to, to a JLO or Larkin system, you know, and the, somebody would publish an article about how to convert a specific program to, you know, working on the, the JLO or Larkin disk systems. I don't recall if I saw one for the, the, that program, Willie, but <clears throat> you know that that's pretty cool <laughs> well uh the whole disk system um it was kind of like a i mean it was more than do it yourself i mean it, you could buy them but i mean you said i think once before there was like 700 or something like that people who had them you read in one of the newsletters is that is that right david right so yeah. there was a, a newsletter that started in um i want to say the late 80s called uh, uh ts 2068 update uh, by a guy named Bill Jones in Florida. And in one of the earliest issues, that's what that's what he said, that there was about 700 systems out there. And then I can't remember the, the, the exact breakdown, but one of the one of the platforms was about 400 install systems and the other one was was less than that. I, I want to say it was the Larkin that was at 400, but it could have been the JLO. Um, it would well, be fascinating that, to get either of those guys on. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Do, does anyone know where those people are at? Or they so, pop up once in a while? Well, Larkin um, is, is 
Larry Kenny, and he's up in uh, Ontario, and uh, he does um, he does software and sells a giant um, CAD uh, no uh, uh, CNC machines. Uh, you you program it, and it cuts you know uh, in in two dimensions, so you can like stick a a slab of of um, of plywood in and, and cut stuff out and put it together. And he actually, uh, he went from um, uh, selling these disk drive systems to programming using the 2068 as a controller for his earliest uh, uh, CAD machines, programming in Pascal, compiling it into Z80, right? I know exactly, Adam. Uh, <laughs> and then, you know, uh, having it, it run these, these, these CAD CAM machines, and then he switched to the PC because he just sort of ran out of power. Um, but he's, he's still around. Uh, I think John Oliger is still around. I've, I've got an address for him. I might have a phone number for him. I don't have an email address. So I might have to pick up the phone one day and actually call somebody on the phone, much as I don't enjoy doing that. <laughs> it's, it's not that hard. It's not that hard. <laughs> you can be done. Yeah, I, I haven't been able to track him down. I used to go over to his house in his basement and we would do some crazy stuff. He taught me a lot of cool things back in that day. It was, he's a really cool guy. And, but he had this little room down in his basement. He had all his little gadgets and gizmos. And I mean, it was, it was pretty impressive. That guy, he was a pretty smart guy. So was John, was that John's main thing or did, was it sort of a sideline for him? No, it was just a sideline, like a little hobby. He, uh, he was a, a engineer for, uh, I can't remember the name of the company he worked for, but he was an engineer for some electronics company firm. And oh. that was his main thing. He just did all the Timex stuff because he liked it and played around with it. And okay. he created all those different, different uh, pieces that he had. The EEPROM program. My first EEPROM programmer was one of his that actually oh. plugged into the expansion board. You hooked an external power supply up to it. And that's how I burnt my first EEPROM so that's crazy that's crazy one of the yeah. other things that <laughs> it was pretty was neat so, one of the other things that was sort of fascinating to me was he designed with um fred knackbauer who started syncware news uh a 99 a t a t time at uh, texas instruments 9918 uh video chip add-on for the 1000 and so you you had there were mm. there were two cards one which had the 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 video chip on it and the other one had the the ROMs that um, that Fred wrote and this just lightly modified the one thousand ROM so that instead of using that you know black and white uh, uh, screen routines it would send all the stuff through the ninety nine eighteen and you could do color with your one thousand so the same video chip in the in the Texas mm -hmm. Instruments computer. Which was very, also in the also in the um, ColecoVision too. That's right, the and, ColecoVision and the yes. MSX machines, I think. Yep, maybe mm -hmm. not. Yep. Yeah, that's okay. right. I, I I had one of those Memotech HRG packs there for my oh, yeah. graphics. So Jay, how did that work for you? Did you did you use it a lot or? Yeah, I converted um, a pie chart program to run on it, so I got uh, I got the uh, smoother uh, uh, graphics that way. <laughs> instead of the blocky thing but the problem was when you copy it to the printer um the pixels aren't the same so uh it, it, i think it was elongated instead of like completely round on the screen oh right right well you know that that, that wasn't um that wasn't a problem limited to the hrg i don't think i think that we had that it depends upon the printer kit you had no, no, and, it wasn't the HRG. It was, it was the display did not line up with, with the printer. Okay. The actual, the actual display, because your, your printout, your copy commands or whatever, it would, you know, it would look kind of squished, uh, like someone pushed it from both sides up. You know, it, it wasn't completely round like it was on the screen. Yeah. Was, yeah. That's a feature. I, I also, it's an isomorphic projection. 
Yeah, well, I I also had the Larkin disk system for the 1000. I've never used it, but I, I wanted to get a, a floppy disk system for it to hook it up. And I think, um, I think Dave Solly might have had one too. He at least had the manual for it. <laughs> he talked to Kenny Lark, uh, Lark, Larry Kenny a lot. Yeah, uh, well, I, I've got it. I've never used it. I just figured, let me buy it, and then I'll figure out what to do with it. <laughs> I, you know, I also have that ZX99 box that has two tapes in, two tapes out, and, and a serial printer thing with the magic number. Did, did you ever use that? Oh yeah, that I did. That that um, I was I was able to get bigger uh, data files because uh, um, it, you know you could actually separate the data from the program that way. Okay. And and um, the the problem was you needed a, a quarter ten ohm quarter watt resistor in the hot lead for the remote, other because it wouldn't close it it wouldn't close the circuit properly. You know, turn it on and off. So, so a friend of mine told me about that. You had you had to actually put a, a ten ohm quarter watt resistor in the hot lead of the remote because it had the 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 microphone on the on the the output and it had the ear thing on the input. You know, ear and ground and mic and ground. But you also it also had the the remote uh, hot and ground. So uh, you you put the uh, 10 ohm quarter watt resistor in the hot hot lead for the for the remote uh, uh i think one eighth inch plug oh that's that's crazy. so this was this was so that you you wouldn't have to press play and record and all that stuff it would just auto do it uh you just uh you just put uh press play and uh you press uh, uh for the two inputs and you press uh play and record for the output and you know it would it would uh stop and start uh depending on the uh the commands you give obviously um it, it must have been uh you have to probably gave some uh address in uh in in, a, in the assembler or something in a in a uh, rem statement or something this plugged into the back of the computer, right? Right. It plugged into okay. the back, and it also had a hot and uh, and ground lead for your serial printer. Uh, you had oh. to roll your own plug, and that was like, a, <laughs> you know, the data the data line of that. And then they had you had to calculate the magic number because there was no way for it to get any uh, input back from the printer that it was busy. So you you test it out first, and uh, uh, this thing lets you also send uh, stuff to the printer. That's really crazy. Um, <clears throat> I have I have a couple uh, things. It, it was to... it was called the ZX ninety nine. Yeah, uh, data data set right. I think right the name right of the data data set a set. That's right right. Let's make it difficult to pronounce. <laughs> right and, and your 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 uh your your mic in your ear uh from your uh ts1000 went into the top of this thing it had the two things on the on the it had the uh, ear and remote uh on the left side and the mic and remote uh on the right side you know there were two two of them yeah and it, uh i think uh on the bottom le left side it also had uh uh, where you plug your printer in. That's crazy. That's uh, uh, just crazy. I remember seeing this thing. Um, so, so speaking of obscure hardware, I'll see if I can sh remember how to share this uh, again. Here we go. Let's see if this works. Right. Here we go. <laughs> so um, <clears throat> does anybody know what this thing is? Anybody who I didn't already board. tell? <laughs> keyboard connectors are on it so i don't know if yeah. i'm gonna beeper it's a, a beeper exactly <laughs> <laughs> right you would you'd plug your your keyboard into here and then there's a there's a little uh jumper cable there's there's actually two of these things that plugged into these second things and you know poked into the computer itself and the the red and the black i think you would solder to uh you know some sort of power connection on on the the main circuit board 
and every time you pressed a key it would make you know a horrific noise through that little Paseo uh, speaker thing um, <clears throat> and since Adam showed us his keyboard earlier I'll show you this little gem <clears throat> that looks uh, awesome David that this is awesome. this is uh, was sold in America as the file 60 um also the second base um and this little doodad you'd stick it on top of your keyboard what the heck is a rum i i thought that should be run somebody's been drinking rum oh my lord you're right <laughs> look at that <laughs> <laughs> and that's not that's even a, a messed up oh that's a rum yeah oh it's God. okay i i've got you didn't spot that right away I got CDO. It's like LCD, but I like to keep the letters in alphabetical sequence. Oh, that's awesome. Wow. So if I put this on my computer, it'll turn into alcohol. And then on the bottom side, you know, there was some self adhesive here a long time ago. And you would press, you know, you'd press a key. Let's see if I can get it to, to stick out. Yeah, right. There you go. And it would, it would press, you know, the membrane for you. Um, which David, was, have you actually used that thing? No, but you know what? I lost it after one as a kid. <laughs> well, I wanted and, one of those too, but it looks so cheesy. Uh huh. Uh huh. Well, and see now I've got um, I've got the uh, the keyboard from uh, this guy in uh, Australia. Um, it's a beautiful keyboard for the one thousand. Um with real keys and it uses those those stickers from that set that um uh that adam uh was showing on the on the news group um his maybe i maybe i should show them uh quick right here i mean just for a moment because oh, yeah, i, I can have them out yeah. yeah i mean i can't do like what you did but i can shove it in front of my face here and it'll be a little out of focus but uh so basically what i i mean i i guess anyone who's a member of the group saw this but i got these stickers and I, I took them off. I bought two sets because they were like $3 or $4. And so I figured if I was going to get those, I'd get some other ones. And then I took off the sets. And you can see I only had to take off some of them because there's this thing holds some for the ZX80, ZX81, and the Spectrum. And they made them really small, so I can't read them. So if mine might say rum as well, but I don't know. It's too small. But <laughs> I took it and I put it on my on this little keyboard I got. It's like a 104 key keyboard, but it's it's kind of tiny and um, it works really nice. I mean, I guess it works like any keyboard would under emulation. So this is not obviously something I have set up. Well, I don't even have a uh, ZX81 or Timex 1000, but um, that's just for emulation use only. And one of the things I like about it here is, I don't know if you saw it, but right here, it's got the little ZX colors, you know, this is spectrum colors, put that on the side there. It makes it perfect, makes it perfect. <laughs> So that that sticker set, Adam, how much did you pay yeah. for it? Like less than four dollars? Yeah, I think it was three fifty or four dollars. It was so cheap. Yeah. And and uh, I do recommend if you if you do buy one of these, um, because I've put them together before for like the Atari and the Commodore ones, and I learned the hard way that if you try to apply them with your fingers, I mean it works, but nothing ever will come out straight. So you use a pair of tweezers, and um, oh, it works good. really really good. And um, my wife was out front uh, the other day when I was applying these talking with some friends and I came outside. She's like, you already finished. I'm like, well, there's not that many keys on that computer. I'm telling you. <laughs> 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 so, yeah, does, but it works good. I recommend know, them. Does anybody I, know if anybody, you know, made like a like a pick so you could plug the, you know, plug it into a 1000 or a 2068 and it would convert it to like AT keyboard so, scan codes? But, I, I I almost have what you're talking what you're what you're looking for. Let's see if it shows up here. Uh, so this uh, this was designed by a guy in um, I think Australia, David Stevenson, if I recall correctly. And there's a circuit board under there. And um, these are these are the ZX81 stickers off of Adam Sheet. And you can see there's a little ribbon cable that comes off the back of it. And this plugs into the back of the, um, the ZX81, but it also has 
uh, I'm not going to disassemble it to show you, but Carl, you can see that it looks like about a 28 pin socket right there. Mm -hmm. And there is a little hole on the side here that is USB, I forget what. So uh, this one, not only can you use it, you know, directly connecting to the to the six eighty one one thousand, but you can use a USB cable and plug it into your PC or Mac. And and just for you know size comparison, I I've got the um, all the memo tech uh, memo pack stuff, including the keyboard, but my W doesn't work anymore. So um, I was wondering who can fix that. Uh, those memo techs probably used um, those uh, sort of closing uh, finger keys with the box um, shaped stem uh, because those were really popular back in the 80s. I don't know who, uh, you know, who made those things, but uh, the only way to repair that is to get another one for parts. <laughs> so currently you have a, you might a pretty keyboard? I'm sorry, might be able to go ahead. Oh, I was just making a stupid joke. Oh. I said currently he has a QWERTY keyboard, yeah, not a QWERTY did, keyboard. Because the W yeah. doesn't yeah. work. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, if you pull the keycap off and you look down in there, you can kind of tell what David's mentioning because you'll see the fingers that are in there. There's like, I don't know, maybe four on each side, maybe. Mm -hmm. uh, and when you push the key down, they kind of, you know, the plastic goes down and the key, the, those fingers come together and touch. Uh, so there may be some oxidation on there. So you may be able to just, you know, I know some guys like to use deoxid a lot, but I mean, you know, you could use, you know, some kind of contact cleaner or, <clears throat> you know, and try to see that. Cause I don't, you know, I don't really know what else would go wrong with that kind of key switch, you know, but um, you could have a bad solder joint too. That's possible, I suppose, but uh, shouldn't be too hard to fix. Yeah, well, th thanks. I, I, I have to get my stuff uh, later this month out of storage. Yeah, I got a lot of stuff there. Um, I bought, uh, I have the FDD system. I have another FDD system that needs repair. It was hit by lightning. <laughs> Good. Well, maybe, uh, maybe Jay, you can do a show and tell uh, with us in, at some point in the future. Yeah, I also wanted to get to you all. Uh, I have all of John McMichael's uh, software on, on tape. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah, that'd be great to digitize, which brings up one of the things that I was, I was hoping we'd talk about tonight was, uh, was trying to organize some archiving of tapes. Um, well, I, I, also, I also wanted to get to you. I have uh, in WordStar format, I, I have the FDD newsletter, which was uh, for the 2068 with the FDD 3000. And when you say in WordStar format, what what is it on like five and a quarter inch discs? Oh no, um, it's on the CF twos. Okay, okay. I'm still trying to get my three. I, I can inch... upload that with, with you know with a modem or something. Okay. Uh, you know, you you have working three inch drives. Yeah, um, I have that. I uh, and Stuart uh, gave uh, had a technician there that uh, hooked up uh, an Amdeck Amdisc three to the FDD three thousand, so I have four discs online at one time. Oh, good lord! Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> All right. Well, let's let's talk. Um, I'll I'll email you about and, that. And, and and it's been years since I have a friend here in the Chicago area. He's an Afghan engineer. I don't know if he's still around, the Nazir Pashtun. Oh, really? Oh, wow. I've yeah, heard that so name. He might be interested in, in this because he was really into it. I think he designed the, uh, the uh, adapter uh, to the, like the uh, spectrum adapter, you know, the T connector. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. The twister? Yeah, he, he, I think he designed the twister. Well, I think he was also really involved in the QL stuff, right? Yeah, I keep shutting my mic off. Sorry. Yeah, I I know he was into into it a lot. Yeah, I, I remember he was in the what was the name of the the Chicago area newsletter? Was it Night Times? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think first first uh, Gary Lessenberry started it. 
with the I, I have the, the the modem program for, for it. Oh wow. Yeah, wow. and I've got the memo packs uh, with the serial connector, the RS-232. I have the memo pack with the Centronics connector. And I had all the all, the high res, the, the um, you know, I got all the memo pack uh, things. I got the 64K there. Very cool. Uh, Ingo, I want to ask you about your uh, your prototype keyboard that you did. Yeah, uh, I... My, my very first computer that I ever owned was a ZX81. And even at 13 with much smaller hands than I have now, uh, <laughs> yeah. like everybody else, it was the one thing that was very frustrating about using that machine. But uh, I tried making a keyboard back then when I was maybe 14 and uh, wired it all up, made a separate case and everything, but it never quite worked right. And then I discovered uh girls and surfing and it kind of was in a box i kept meaning to fix it and make it work but it never happened and then lost it uh now in my 50s i got it got my hands on a, a zx81 and a ts1000 and uh decided okay this is it i'm gonna make that keyboard and i bought a bunch of uh gatoron uh mechanical switches uh went to my local maker space laser cut a plate out of uh black acrylic uh glued the switches into it hand wired all the switches using a rainbow colored ribbon cable and then um i got black keycaps plain plastic black keycaps and then i went into inkscape and made svg images for every single keycap I printed those out on water transfer laser printable decal paper, cut them all out, applied them all one by one by hand, uh, had a really bad experience. The, uh, the decals peeled right back up again after like a day and a half, two days, and I was just crushed. Started looking on YouTube and found out that all the uh, hardcore plastic model builders have these different solutions that they use on their water transfer decals that actually turn them into like cellophane or just make them very pliable so that they shape to whatever irregular surfaces there are. Went to the local railroad shop, got some of that stuff, did a second run and it took, um, sprayed it with some clear coat varnish, put like three, maybe four coats of clear coat varnish on it. Turned out pretty nice uh, for a first try. It's a lot of work for just one keyboard. So it's not a production method, but um, it, it, it turned out really good. So uh, I'm, I'm happy with the results. It's nice. I got that tactile, clicky keyboard feeling. Um, you could, of course, build it with any kind of uh, key switches. And uh, so I'm my brother and I are trying to figure out a way to make a bigger ZX81 case that actually looks like the ZX81, but uh, big enough to fit the full-size keyboard. And uh, I'm blogging about the mods that we're doing and the, the tinkering we're doing. Um, my next blog post will be about the keyboard. So I will be, uh, you know, posting pictures and sharing what I did and how I did it. So if anybody else wants to attempt it. I'll probably share all the files too. Um, I don't want anyone to have to go through all that work in Inkscape, Inkscape again. I figured I did it. I'd be more than glad to share that. So um, yeah. So what, what's the, um, can you post the address for your blog in the chat, Ingo? Yeah, absolutely. Cool. Um, and it'll, it'll probably be a few weeks before I uh, post about the keyboard. Right now, there's just some stuff about doing composite mods and uh, I just started blogging last year and I haven't been on it as regular as I should. So, but let me, uh, I'll, I'll put a link to you to the blog. Yeah, we definitely you just want to take, see this. take my $50. <laughs> yeah, I was kind of looking at doing something like that too, with uh, you know, maybe like a TI keyboard because those still are kind of around, uh, you know, Radio Shack, I guess, bought all the 
spares, you know, once TI got out of the market and they used to sell those at their stores, right? And I know other people have made, you know, ZX81 keyboards out of that, that TI-99 keyboard, right? And that's a, well, there's, I have a couple of TI-99s and, you know, there's several different makes of keyboard, right, that they used in those things, you know, the Mitsumis and Mitsumis are kind of crappy because they're just a, a membrane kind of thing too, right? Mm -hmm. And then I think uh, the earlier TI-99s, they actually used, uh, you know, real keyboard switches in there instead of a membrane. I don't know who made those. Maybe uh, somebody might know. But anyway, so they're, they're, they may all look kind of similar, right? But they the technology inside of them had, had changed over the years. Um, but kind of what I was asking, you know, when, when Dave showed his little thing was, you know, I, I kind of thought, well, I don't know if somebody's made like a, basically convert the, 2068 or the ZX81, you know, the keyboard connectors, you know, run it through a PIC controller. And so you could hook up a, a regular IBM, you know, your, your regular keyboard to it, like a USB keyboard. Uh, and then you could use your, you know, your Inkscape decals and you could probably, well, I don't know, they wouldn't, they, they probably wouldn't have to be see-through, right? They'd have to be, you know, they would have to cover what was already on the keyboard to begin with, right? Uh, but that way you could use any, you know, keyboard that's available today, you know, plug that into this, you know, yeah, USB you thing. Could. Yeah, you could with these, they're, they're actually fully opaque um, because, you know, the, the, on the ZX81 and the TS1000 keys, you've got kind of a gray field mm -hmm. and I use black keycaps. So I had to, you know, so I, I actually found a, laser printable decal paper that's white instead of clear yeah so i'm only printing the black and the red onto it and the, the background's white and so it uh, that applied to a black keycap it it worked out pretty good i was i was surprised but mm -hmm. you know um I, i'll definitely yeah, I just, be posting pictures on that okay. but yeah you could put it over any keyboard absolutely right and then, you know, um, one of the guys that subscribed to my blog, he's in Denmark, and he's really big on the uh, Sinclair ZX World uh, mm -hmm. Forum. Oh. And uh, Martin. Yeah, and Martin. Some of you guys. Uh -huh. have, yeah, he posts quite a bit. And uh, he and I started talking. And um, he, uh, he mentioned also there's, uh, there's a set of keycaps that you can buy that are have like a clear wrapper around them you can pop those off and you could like get like paper cut out it wouldn't even have to be a sticker um i think they were on um adafruit maybe he sent me a link you I can get those a bunch of places one of them is amazon i know exactly what you're yeah. talking about those are nice well i know yeah. yeah i know back in the day there used to be keyboard caps that yeah you could they had a clear cover, right? It would snap on the key. So you could actually put something inside of it and then snap the clear cover over it. Yeah. I don't know that they do those anymore, right? But they, they I mean, do. Key... I, I have a I have a set for, uh, that are 20 foot, like they're four columns of six that, and I um, bought it with the intention of using it for um, the Astrocade, of course. And, um, and unfortunately, like there, I use it with the MAME emulator and there's this weird, like one or two second delay between pressing the key and MAME emulation, it doesn't happen with like Windows, but like through the MAME emulation. So it's not it's not functional like I wanted, but mm. they, I've seen them, like I've seen the regular keyboards too. So they're around. Yeah, but I was just, you know, I don't know that anybody's ever made, like I said, that that part of it that uses a, not necessarily a pick, right? But some kind of microcontroller is gonna have to do the conversion, right? To, you plug a USB connector or even like an old AT keyboard, right? A PCAT keyboard with the, the DIN or the, the PS2 connector, right? You hit a key on there, it's a that's a whole computer, right? That's inside the keyboard on those things, right? The 80, yeah. 8042 yeah, microcontroller. Right. And they have and all, so, these proprietary, all these different scan codes. And all, right, yeah. right. So somebody would have to- And they get pretty to complex complete. too. Yes, because you can hit multiple, well, some keyboards mm -hmm. you can hit, you know, three, four, five keys at a time, right? And it can track that kind of thing. But I just don't know that anybody's made that part of the puzzle to convert, you know, PCAT keyboard scan codes into, you know, pushing a key on the ZX81 or the 2068. 
It's I, it's funny that you say that because I I'm actually one for my second prototype. One of the things that I want to do is go to a sixty percent layout. So actually have a full space bar, you know, both shift keys, uh, a, a bigger enter key, and the only way to really do that, I think, is to you know get uh, a microcontroller on the board and have it spit out what the TS-1000 of the ZX81 wants to see, right? But allow it to, allow the user to custom map their keyboard. And uh, I think that that would be very doable, you know, just, and then make it so that you can kind of like up, update your own firmware on the keyboard. Um, but the same thing could definitely be done for what you're talking about, because the, uh, the Model M keyboard uh, and any of the PS2 type keyboards, they've got a, basically a, a, a microcontroller in the keyboard that's communicating mm -hmm. all those, those scan codes. The, uh, every time you press a key, every time you lift a key, it sends a different code back to the, to the computer and the computer has to have another chip, you know, like another microcontroller that has to then convert that. So yeah, it's uh, pretty elaborate, but it's doable. Um, yeah. Somebody should I mean, just I, I do mean, it. Right. I just don't know anybody that's, you know, and I just, yeah, I probably could do it, but you know, I just, where am I going to find the time to, <laughs> you know, to sit down yeah. and figure that out. That, <laughs> that's kind of the other thing, but it's just, you know, it's a low hanging fruit that, you know, there's so many PC keyboards, right. Right. That are out yeah. there. I mean, yeah. so if you like a particular smaller style, you like the bigger style, I mean, it'd be nice to be able to use that maybe like in an emulator or actually hooking it up to the you know actual hardware. But um, yeah. I mean, you could actually go inside these keyboards, right? And, you know, probably hook the matrix up yourself, right? Mm -hmm. Instead of relying on that microcontroller that's built in, but that's just even more work, right? <laughs> right, right. And, then, and now the keyboard's kind of stuck to being just used for that, right? You can't use it as a normal keyboard anymore. So that's kind of the low hanging fruit. I'm thinking, you know, you have all these keyboards, you have the keyboard scan codes, you know, that's that's common to all of these. So we just need that that converter, right? That little converter, convert the AT scan codes into just a key press on the Timex machines. And I think, you know, I come in, I remember looking around to see if somebody had done that before, and I don't think I really came up with anything. So yeah, actually, um, the the FPGA emulators do that. I I've written a couple of them that will take um, a PS2 keyboard and convert the scan codes to uh, something that the that the 2068 or the CX81 would understand. And so um, I haven't done anything with USB because that's a that's a whole different, more difficult mm -hmm. thing to do. But right. um, actually, you could probably use a um, Oh, what am I trying to say here? Uh, a Pi Pico to do that. Mm -hmm. They're like they're like four bucks. Right. Yeah, it's just the coding, and uh, like I said, I don't. You know, we don't need a scan code for when it pushes or when it releases, right? We just need the one. And of course, the Timex is just a, it's just a shorting out the address and and right. uh, the not data lines, but it gets there's key codes that go back into the SCLD chip, right? Yeah, from the a, address a, lines, right? Sort of a cross bus, cross bar system. Right. So, Carl, actually, Jack Doheny did do that. Oh, um, really? And I, <laughs> yeah, and I posted it's the second link that I posted into the chat. The first link is modern versions of those keycaps, uh, keycaps, right? Right, right. Jack's, Jack's schematic uses, um, he uses two uh, 2764s, it looks like and a bunch of clocks and other stuff. So it looks like he's using the EEPROMs as, um, you know, a state. He's mapping them, right, yeah. he's mapping um, them. Yep, mapping them through, um, which is, you know, the perfectly reasonable for 96, yeah. Uh, yeah. you know, but, but, definite, but definitely, you know, use a PIC now or, or an Arduino yeah, today, or Today, I think something. it'd be a lot easier to use the newer technology to just do that. Are, are you thinking of connecting it through to the expansion port? Oh, is that um, question to me? Yeah, I'm just, I'm just curious when, you, when you're thinking through this, uh, you know, how are you, you know, most people are not gonna open it up and mess with the interior. 
of their 2068. So yeah, I don't mm. know how you could do it with the expansion port because those lines that we're talking about don't come out. They don't the live back, there, right? Yeah. So no, they they do. Um, well, the, I mean, the address lines have come out, but the the key scan lines don't. They just go straight to the. They don't come out to the expansion bus. So as far as I can remember, it's not scanning not, for the. Yeah. Uh, but it's um, not like scanning for an address shorted to a data line. It's it's like I think the address lines or the data lines get shorted to these five. I think there's five. Yep. You know, yeah. There's scan there's lines. Five, five five. It's a five bit input port on the uh, ULA in the case right. of the uh, ZX81 well, and the TS1000. Well, 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 I know my uh, Memotech keyboard had like a little pack you put onto the expansion port. Yep. Uh, so you could type and it would it would uh, read those keys that you typed, uh, you know, because uh, it was hooked up to the back uh, expansion port. Right. So they, they must have did some trickery inside that, you know, it'd be kind of interesting to see what's inside that thing. There, there's a couple. How they did that. Uh, uh, Carol, I can share. Um, it's going to take me a little bit longer to find it, but I can share uh, a schematic that uses a couple of... Um, of um, chips to do that because there was a guy in um, in Ontario uh, who designed uh, you know a, an external keyboard for the the twenty sixty eight and an interface that either plugged into the cartridge slot or into the back bus however you, however you liked you know whatever your preference was um, and you could take that as the basis and stick a you know stick a processor in front of it to do the the pc to you know uh, right well it's just conversion. it's just it's just it's kind of we're lucky that we have the zx80 right the zx80 because you yeah. can see how the keyboard was done in discrete logic yep. right so if you can figure that out and i'm sure the 2068 probably very similar to that right it probably maybe goes into some i don't know io ports or something like that i you know i don't know how it's all wired up i haven't it, looked it's at that, the same but... it's the same as the 1000 okay yeah. okay <laughs> so if you could figure that out on the zx80 since you have it all discrete then you could figure out a way that's probably how they did memo tech did theirs is they they probably use io lines you know and then force the information into the io lines so yeah looking they, at uh, Looking at the ZX81 schematic, it's different from the 2068 because they've just hung the keyboard right off of the address and data bus. And the 2068? In the 2068, the outputs for the keyboard do go into the SCLD. Okay, so the so the 1000, they don't. The That's correct. Is, okay, okay. Well, so maybe you can do it from the expansion bus on the 1000. Sorry, I didn't want to kind of derail this, but I just I just thought it would be nice to have like use a use a PC keyboard, right, and hook it up to the 1000. That way, you get rid of the keyboard complaints, because <laughs> then you can pick your own keyboard that you're comfortable with and stick the decals on there, right? Or if you could, uh, uh, I don't know, upgrade the ROM in it to use uh, some of these newer. Um, base it or you know like they do on the spectrum next right where you can actually type the instead of just the keyword you can actually type print right actually so, type uh, right, right. <laughs> that's the whole point of it too but well and but, that's another uh, thing that that jack did was he re he wrote a little a little um a little bit of code to let you do that that you would load into your um loading you know off a tape or whatever uh, so, Carl, I'm going to share my screen real quick because I have the redrawing I did of the um, the schematic, but I cannot remember where I found this. Uh, and this is the um, the schematic of the one that plugs into the cartridge port. Mm -hmm. It's the, mm -hmm. the cartridge port over here to the left. So there's a 32, the 365 is what's doing most of the magic. In terms of of converting those scans to the right uh, lines, yeah. So, so it looks like a data so line. You, you redrew it. that yourself, David, or you you found this? I redrew it from. Um, oh, okay. Something. And you haven't built it though. I, well, actually, I did order these, and I just haven't tested them yet. 
So oh, I have well, like by five next of meeting, these. You'll have that done. <laughs> Here, I'll show you what the. I'll show you what the, right, next week I'll have that done. Here's what the. This is yeah. Here's what the. You know my crappy layout of the cart looks like. Um, and you know I did not think too much about my connector. And and when I got the cards, I was like, ah, oh, now I have to build something that goes to this weird connector and it should have i should have thought more about this it looks before. like a it looks like a what a point one dual line header right oh yeah yeah mm -hmm. it's it it's exactly is but uh you know my my problem is is that i did not uh, uh think about what i was going to use to connect from my keyboard matrix to to the circuit board so okay I, you know, I didn't plan it out too good. <laughs> and I, I know I found this uh, design somewhere in one of the zines and I'll have to go back and dig around to see if I can find it again. Um, I, I want to say that this might be um, uh, John McMichaels or something like that. You know, I just might want to make a suggestion here. You know, I know you make the twister boards with the ROMs, and I, I know Superflow does as well, but you might want to think, I don't know if people want to do that in the cartridge slot, because then you can't close it. You're going oh, you mean with, to the, have with the keyboard thing? Right. Oh, this I was just for me. Maybe this... you could... Okay, okay. That was for me to fool so around with. You would probably be better off putting that on, like, on the back, on, the, on, the, on a twister board or something mm -hmm. like that. That mm -hmm. way, you know, the cartridge port isn't taken up by by yep. just one keyboard thing. <laughs> yep. Absolutely. Since there's so few, yeah, there's so few. Well, there's only two chips, but there's a lot of discrete there, right? A lot of diodes, obviously. Yeah, there, yeah. But, yeah, there's a couple of diodes. Yeah. But, as a matter of fact, um, I'll show you this little thingy that I worked on. I sent I sent um Willie one of these. Uh let's see if this is there we go. So this is a little expansion bus thingy that I built. And um, it says it's Oligar compatible, but it's only Oligar compatible if you put this jumper wire in. <laughs> so I sent Willie a couple and he's like, you know, I tried to get it to work and it just won't work. And he ended up having to send me his um, his Oligar cards. And I found out that that there's this real sensitive timing issue that requires it to be powered from the 2068. It can't be powered, um, can't be powered separately because there's some sort of, um, you know, I think it pulls it pulls BE down um, um, as it boots up. So the Oligar uh, uh, chip boots up, and uh, then it lets the the, the 2068 boot. Yeah, I was going to say those two lines look like the power lines, right? The nine volt or the 15 volts. And the oh, so the green volts. one. Yeah, the green one was the five volt line. The 15, okay. I didn't bother connecting. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, Ingo, share, share. Let me make sure that everybody's can, everybody can share. And um, let me see, is advanced sharing options? All participants. Okay. So another Ingo, thing, too, David, since we're kind of, you know, I'm, I'm making like little cartridge things, you know, those 1510 clones. Yeah. And I noticed I was looking when I was over at Adam Tausch, you know, your board that you sent him. You know, how do you make the little uh, keyway uh, things that go inside the connector? You know what I'm talking for the key? Oh. That's on the expansion. You're talking bus? about the edge connector? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you so buy those. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. I was just going to like, uh, I yeah. Don't know, um, some, some circuit boards up or something. <laughs> no, no. Uh, it's it's you can get you know, those from digikey thank you yes uh-huh well i know i did get some that go like in between the connectors right on the expansion bus on the 2068 on the back it's actually takes a connector slot right so the two connectors i actually push them out right so now it's just a gap and then you push i see a lot of people put printed circuit boards in there they just cut a rectangular one and they push it in there yeah other I've people done. have drilled holes right through yep, and a little, little piece of metal yeah yeah commercial things where they've they've done that um i know on the cartridge slot you're right on the cartridge slot you can buy those little pieces that go in between the connectors right the, the connectors actually made for those and you can put them in there as a keyway but uh you know that's not the way it's set up on the uh, on the expense yeah see those that right uh, there 
Um, really? It's either Mouser or DigiKey that I bought that from. Okay. They're, they're ridiculously expensive for what they are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I looked at them too, and I was like, you know, I, I don't know that I wanted to go that route. I was just going to cut up some, you know, is surfboards it, it, or something like that. Is it simply a piece of plastic? Is that all that is? Yeah. Basically, oh, yeah. yeah. I think it's 30% unobtainium at the cost. Yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> I know I've done that in the past where, you know, other people have like pinched the two metal connectors together and soldered them together. Right. So that's mm-hmm. kind of a yep. cheap way to do it. Yep. Uh, you know, on the ones I got, I could just push the connector out from the back. Right. So you totally remove the metal connector and now you're just left with the open cavity and then you can stick something in there. But uh, wow, that's nice. Ingo. That's really yeah, cool. That is, that is nice. So we'll be ordering those from you. <laughs> already in the mail <laughs> I, check, have to, check. I have to beg a question here so now that you have the keyboard have you typed a basic program in or anything <laughs> Ingo have you typed in a basic program or anything have you used your keyboard uh, yeah I have okay. uh, of Good. course as soon as soon as I was done uh, I, I was in a very hot hurry to get that thing plugged in and <laughs> and try it out and yeah it was it was just amazing i had a complete nerdgasm uh <laughs> being able being able to you know i i just ever since i first put my hands on a model m keyboard on an original ibm pc uh there's just never been uh any experience that beats that buckling spring i'm one of these people that really loves that tactile and that auditory response when you hit a key and uh you know i i could imagine an office full of people using loud keyboards would be very nerve-wracking but uh yeah it just it was it was awesome um so yeah it's just uh now it's just a matter right now it's just kind of laying on my desk i don't have like a case for it and it's too big to fit you know in the original zx81 case yeah but I was kind of, like I said, I was kind of looking at something like that. And I know Hammond makes those, like, they're kind of called like instrument enclosures, right? Where they're kind of sloped. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And that's uh, what I had when I was, when I was 14, it was a, it was a slightly anodized uh, aluminum case. It was like two halves with like two plastic ends. And mm-hmm. I remember cutting out the profile of the keyboard and right. making little, little hooks that it would rest on. And I wired everything up, but when I, when I connected it to my Zeddy, it just didn't work. And I, mm. you know, I, I tried and tried for a while, you know, the 14 year old me and, and just, you know, gave up. I, uh, yeah. I, and I've, re- I've regretted that ever since it's been <laughs> something, this is, this is a vindication. I had to do it. You know, I had to get that keyboard working. So that right. was double, <laughs> double pleasure. <laughs> uh, Ingo, I have a, I have a personal request from you. I've, I, I lashed up a CX81 emulator on one of my FPGA boards, and it's using a PS2 keyboard. And one thing I've noticed is that I can get out ahead of the CX81 when I'm typing. And mm-hmm. I'd be interested to know whether or not real hardware in your keyboard um, can keep up with, I guess, what you'd consider normal typing speed. Um, because I, I found that if I type too quickly, it just it, it doesn't respond. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Or it, I've noticed keys. it it does that. It does exactly that. I oh. I am by far not a fast typist, and uh, without even trying to go really fast, you know, it's if I if I jump too quick to the next key, it just misses it. So I I actually have to consciously slow down. So you know, it's. Um, I don't know if anybody's experienced the same thing with the membrane. It's hard to type very fast on that membrane keyboard. <laughs> and uh, no matter what you, you know, <laughs> you'd have to be superhuman, I think. But yeah, with the uh, the key switches, that is one thing. And, um, and I think it has to do with how the uh, ULA uh, scans the keyboard. Yeah, exactly. fast mode or slow mode? Uh, well, fa- I haven't tried it in faster. fast mode. Well, there's no buffer. Found, there's I think no it works buffer, better in right? fast mode. 
Yeah. Yeah. Fast, mm. fast mode is a little bit faster. Although I found that with the old ZX81 keyboard, the back end of a ball peen hammer works really well to make sure you get the keys pressed, but. <laughs> you just guys weren't doing it right. You don't press them, you stroke it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, no I know when I was, I know when I was a kid that, yeah, you didn't have to push the keyboard very hard. You know, you just barely, you know, kind of, and it, it would take it. But. Oh, you must have had a touchy one because I, I really had to, you know, center my fingers and concentrate on what I was doing to get to 40 words a minute. Oh, wow. <laughs> but, you know, I, realize there's no there's no buffer, right? There's, there's no, no buffer. buffer in those. So, yeah, if you type ahead of it, if you can't, it it's not going to be able to do that. So that could be something else that could be put into that little converter thing, right, where you could you could actually have a keyboard buffer. So as you type faster, it would just you know, it would send a key out to the 20 or the Timex machine every, you know, I don't know, 100 milliseconds or whatever somebody figured out it could handle, right? And then mm. that way you could build up a buffer and you could type, you know, 20 things ahead and it would, you could just sit there and watch it fill out <laughs> everything that you typed, right? <laughs> so you're, that, you're describing something that I talked to, um, this is coming back to me now. Stuart and I had a conversation quite a while ago where he wanted to do something similar to that. And he basically wanted to, you know, take a, say, you know, Arduino or whatever and interface it directly to the computer and you would load your program into the Arduino and it would type the program into the computer for you. <laughs> yeah, that's that could that's be a, a possibility too. That's creative. Yeah, that's creative. Yeah. It's, it's a good idea. <laughs> load a text file into it or whatever with your basic program and it'll type it in for you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I want to jump in here real quick. Remember the things I talked about a little bit ago? I went, took a break and I went to the garage. Oh boy. Oh boy. Ah. <laughs> oh, the cereal port. The cereal port. Port. <laughs> oh, what God. the back looks like. You see the cereal inside. But yep, there's all the, yep. the oh my screws God. for the porthole. Yeah. Oh my God. That is that awful. Weigh? I love it. Yeah. And <laughs> that's super sugar that smacks, isn't it? Could be. This is the talker. Okay. Listen. Oh. Can you can you I don't know where the microphone is on my Mac, but can you hear that? You can hear it. Yeah. So I don't yeah. know what it's saying. Was it saying okay? Okay. All right. It's basically the only test you've got on it. So you just push it. And comes back <laughs> saying okay, meaning it's working. <laughs> so this has been sitting in the garage for I don't know how long, but it still works. It's where's the mic? Is that battery powered? Is that what that is? No, it's actually got a a, a TI power supply. Like the huh. TI computer, that monster? Oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> it's got a wall warp. Yeah. That's oh, the okay. A little calculator supply. And mm. then they're using like a and here's the uh, serial connector. Nice. Huh. And that may need to be repaired. Handmade. Yeah. Yeah. One of the things that's come off. Nice. Doesn't even have, doesn't so, even have a cover over it. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. So I think one has come off, but it, it's, 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 some, it's again, three pins. Right. Yeah. So, right. But that's what, again, no label on it. I think I've opened it. I don't know what's inside. It's been so long. So it probably was hand, handmade, I guess. I don't know. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah, that doesn't sound like the Votrax chip. I remember what that one sounded like a gazillion years ago. Jeez. Yeah, so I don't know what's inside. Yeah, that kind of sounds more like, you know, the TI speak and spells, right? Which is kind of, I think, what the GI or did TI make their own for that? Yeah, I, I had their TI own. made their own. Yeah. Yep. Theirs was, um, they had their own. Uh, uh, vocal set, modeling yeah. it was like lcm or lpm lpm or something like that yeah and yeah. gi had a yeah, different i don't model. know what when that was made uh yeah i got it in the early 90s could be much earlier i don't know well, you should you should pop it open and take some pictures and see. yeah <laughs> <laughs> at least you'll see what chips send in it there. To somebody yeah 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 David, uh, you were uh, saying uh, last one of the things we talked about is uh, you want to keep a track on time. And I noticed there's like 15 minutes left. Oh, my God. Uh, yeah. So um, I don't know what we wanted to still get uh, to talk about and uh, maybe talk about what we're going to talk about next time. And so, I, I, 
Right. So, so one of the things that I'd like to try to get together, get organized is some kind of archiving of, you know, old tapes that people have floating around. So, um, Jay, you said you had some stuff. Um, Tim, you might have tapes and, and things, who knows what. Um, Keith, uh, do you think you have any, any old tapes or anything? Oh, you're still you're still muted, Keith. Let's see if I can get you to unmute. Um, but anyway, uh, I'd like to somehow figure out how we can, you know, get a, get organized and and preserve some of this stuff we all have sitting around. I have lots of commercial stuff. Okay. Okay. Cool. Well, uh, I so think we... uh, you know you should send it all to Adam, and then uh, he's got a good setup for that already. <laughs> what? Well, and, hey, what? and he said he had this friend who's like a miracle worker. Oh, that that is true, Paul <laughs> Paul Backer. In fact, if we if we do get a, a thing going, maybe I'll ask him. Even though he's like doesn't have a timex or anything, he uh, like I've mentioned before, he um, and I think yeah, I, I forwarded you that message from him, right, David? Mm -hmm. About yeah, mm -hmm. um, maybe he'll join in just just to give some tidbits on the best way to. Um, Get the best uh, recordings because, I mean, he he did a whole bunch of experiments just using different um, cabling, um, oh. and he real like he you know I mean you 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 would think it makes a difference and it really does but knowing that someone has done it like he used platinum cables um, for audio cables and it made all the difference in the world and I was like eh, is that going to make a difference at all and it it did like he was able to get some stuff that wasn't um, uh, able to be digitized well it was able to be digitized but not in a good condition right and just that little bit of difference made it uh, made it work and that's the hardware side obviously but then he has all these tools that he would use on the software side to to clean up the files so right so let's keep that as a future agenda item um i have a whole bunch of folks that i have reached out to to try to get to come to future uh, uh meetings um tom tom woods who is the guy that did uh profile uh the profile databases the the thing that that willie talked about um he also did a bunch of other stuff he took over publishing of syncware news at one point uh and published that um he with tom bent made a 32k uh, cartridge that would go in your in your um, cartridge slot 30 you can ram cartridge uh, that you could use to get like for data or put your own programs on it or something um, there was a guy um, who there was a there was a popular uh, uh, interface uh, analog to digital interface for the for the 1000 in the 81 called the votem v-o-t-e-m and this thing plugged into your uh, cassette port and it did analog to sound basically. And then the little program would run on the, you know, on the, the computer to convert that sound to, um, you know, to a number. Uh, and that apparently, according to the, one of the guys uh, who made it, that was used on a uh, project that was supposed to go in one of the shuttles. Not positive if it if it actually made it on there, but yeah, uh huh. Um, as in space shuttle? As in space shuttle. Okay, yes. just checking. Uh huh. Um, so his name is Alger Salt, and I'm hoping he'll he'll join us in the future. Um, but anyway, I have a long, a long list of, of folks that I'm you know trying to get uh, uh, to come. Oh. Uh, uh, Will mentioned two folks, um, um, both of whom I've reached out to. One of whom's a little busy right now, but is going to is going to connect with me in a few weeks, and um, so we might have another Timex er Timex person um, uh, joining us in a few weeks. Uh, Lon Hildreth is his name, and I don't know what he did, so it's a great mystery to me right now. <laughs> um will also mentioned uh dave ornstein who i've reached out to before uh, um and i will try to touch base with again dave was involved very early on 
in um, with first with Sinclair, uh, and if if you look at uh, say early issues of Syntax and early issues of Sync Magazine, you'll find articles by him. And he was um, he was a person you could buy the schematic for the ZX80 uh, from him back in the back in the in the day, as it were. Um, and he was kind of young, uh, as Scott said, uh, not Scott, as, as Will said, you know, in, he worked at Timex briefly and he was like 18. So, you know, this is a young kid uh, at the time um, who just managed to get his door, foot in the door at the right, you know, time and place. And he was very enthusiastic. Uh, he had, um, he must have had some kind of demo model of the 2068 because uh an article he wrote an article that appeared in sync magazine just before we could get the 2068 and so he you know talked a little bit about in his article about the the specs and stuff um and the other thing i want to do is try to get uh you know some sort of semi-regular topics that we'd all like to talk about um you know, show and tells. We'll get Ingo to to demonstrate his actual keyboard for us. <laughs> I, I would like I would like um, to see if we can get Bruno on the show as well. So Bruno can't demo stuff. Make um, Bruno can't make Monday nights, but he can make Sunday afternoons. Okay. And so he's he's tentatively uh, ready for us. Maybe even you know for that next Sunday in two weeks. Okay. Because in case people who aren't um, paying attention on the group or sorry, sorry not not paying attention who aren't on the group but um he brought to the table some zx uh, uh spectrum things that have been converted to the timex um that um we all had the opportunity to try there was uh two 1k demos and oh, i'm one... sorry that's a different bruno yes oh different bruno how many different Brunos bruno. are there i was i was talking about the california bruno you're talking about the the bruno Portugal. in in oh. um yeah, we don't talk about bruno if we get one more, we can play tic tac toe. Like, yes. like <laughs> okay. Yes, we'll see if we can get him on too. He would oh, probably okay. be good for a Sunday. Yeah, that'd be awesome. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So okay. We, we do the third Sunday of the month, right? That's correct. And yep. what is it this this month? I, I so that's a good question. It's Easter. It's Easter Sunday. Oh, that won't work, will it? Well, at least not for me. Um. So we could move to the fourth Sunday of this month. Um, be better. which would be better. Okay. So what I'll do is I will move this one to the fourth and I'll make sure everybody knows. As long okay. as nobody here is Orthodox because that's Orthodox Easter. Mm -hmm. I just, okay, I give up my, on religion. On my <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm Orthodox, but I'm Jewish. I thought that, yeah. <laughs> um, so does the fourth Sunday work for uh, most folks this month? I think so. Okay. Yeah. Okay. My, my sci-fi book club was also moved to that day. So right oh. after this meeting, I go to that meeting, but that's in person. So tell yeah. them, tell them to push it back. <laughs> <laughs> well, they don't meet till two thirty. Well, two thirty in Mexico time. So you, this okay. you, said, over. you said fourth Sunday of uh, April. That's correct. And I'll, I'll send out an email about that. Um, I'll send out one that works, this yeah. week and in two weeks. Okay, I'll, I'll try to get uh, in touch with Nazir. Oh, that'd be awesome. Yes, yes. Please, please get him to, to you know, join us on, on email and in, in the Zoom. Last time I checked, he was living in Chattanooga. Oh, wow. Okay, okay. All right. Um, so, and Naz, for those of you who don't know, Nazir was uh, very involved in the Chicago uh, user group and had a lot of, of um, published a lot of, of articles in the Night Times News. I think that was exactly. the name of the, the newsletter. Right. Um, uh, after Gary Lessonberry left, I think Bob Swoger took it over. Yeah. And Bob's still around. Uh, he's active in the color community, color computer community. Coco. Yes. It would be nice to get Bob on because Bob wrote this uh, program that was a front end to 
uh, the Larkin and I think the Oliger DOS systems. So it's like a menuing system for loading. Got oh, hey, look at that. Yep, I just haven't have it. Oh. Right, Times oh. News, plural right, Times News, yeah. His, his name should be right there on the front cover somewhere. So this think. is uh, 1995. Okay, okay. Yeah, Nazir Pashtun, President, Vice President Steve Cooper, and Editor Bob Swoger. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So um, I'll put out a call for for topics um, for the next one that's going to be in three, three weeks. Yeah, three three weeks. Um, yeah, that'll be fun because we'll have we'll have a Sunday and then then we'll have a Monday that follws on almost immediately but that's okay let's do it yeah since you two are on okay yeah go ahead carl well i just wanted to thank david for sending me that uh oh good you got it yeah i got the 1500 cartridge i haven't tried it but you know it's just nice to have one that will should work in there right because they're they're brown colored as you noticed right they're not black colored like the 2068 ones and also thank again thanks again to tim because he you know uh, uh it's probably been a month now that he sent me that uh that casio pb100 pocket computer i appreciate that too <laughs> and ingo too thanks for uh showing us your keyboard and talking about that pretty awesome yeah i can't wait to see, you see them my, my pleasure yeah i've been dying to share it with some somebody other than my brother so uh <laughs> as you guys i i'll uh I'll, I'll hurry up and get the blog post put together and then uh cool try and put more more juicy details in there for everybody very cool thanks Carl, thank you. Thank you. Check the comments of the last meeting. There's a guy named, uh, there's a person named Daniel who has apparently um, a, a built a replica of the 1510 mm-hmm. and cartridges. And they, okay. and, they, and they posted a picture of it. Oh, okay. I have to look at that. So, yeah, reach, yeah, reach out got, to that person. And, I've got like 35 boards, but like I said, I'm, I'm, I got to cut up the connectors, right? Because they're mm-hmm. like what? I bought 120 pin. Well, oh. they're 60. They're 60 pin long, so I could. Uh, but I got to cut them up, and then, like I said, I was like, you know, what do you guys use for a key? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yes, uh, yes, because I know the one that's on the like specy.pl, the where I got the board, you know, the Eagle files for to make the PCBs. Yeah, they don't have a um, they don't have a key in the cartridge slot in the you know the cartridge connector, which could be potentially a problem. Oh, right. Because okay. uh, unless you buy the hey. exact 18 pin, you know, on each side connector, which would be what, 36 pin, you know, yeah. you could potentially, you know, shift that thing around in there. So, Myers. Uh, yes. But uh, Tom G used to do a zebra, and she mm-hmm. would just solder two of the pins together right. to, make a, to, make, to make a divider. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I've seen that done as well. We'd be able to buy keys, and we would just put them in. But yet, I don't know that they make things like that anymore. <laughs> yeah, I and if they do, they're probably like I said, they're like ninety cents each, which is ridiculous. It's about right. <laughs> yeah, I mean, as Jeff said, it's thirty percent unobtainium. Yeah. <laughs> but thanks, Al. Yeah, thanks. I, I have seen that done before too. It's just. I, I don't know. To me, it just doesn't seem as professional as, you know, something that's actually in there. Uh, it'd be great to have connectors that were made that way, but of course, I don't think you can even do that anymore. I might help you on that. Adam, did we did we cover everything we need to cover? Uh, you tell me. I, I, we're <laughs> ending on time if we did. If we didn't, we're, we're still ending, so. <laughs> we're still ending on time, yes. All right. Even, yeah. even at Zebra, we bought larger connectors and cut them down in a bandsaw. Yeah, that's yeah. what I've Both been doing. 2068 and the TS-1000. Yeah, yeah I've yeah. got a little chop saw that I, I bought over at Harbor Freight that I think is going to be perfect for that because you can actually, you know, put it up against the fence, right? So it won't move around. Right. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. And you just drop the saw on it and cut, you know, it should, I haven't tried it yet, but I think that'll work really, really well for that. Um, Carl, is the same is the I know that the 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 twenty sixty eight and the fifteen ten where the slot is is flipped, so you know the slot on the the twenty sixty eight is on the left, and right. on the on the fifteen ten it's on the right. 
is it the mm -hmm. same spacing that i don't know i think on the when i was looking at your cartridge i think there's two pins on yep. the on the left, left and yes. then there's the notch yes right there and then there's the cut yep on the 26a cartridge i haven't looked at that in a while so i don't know exactly where that is i don't think i think it's further in i think it may be three or four connections in okay okay because i have some i have some extra um uh 2068 cartridge connectors oh, okay doesn't sound like they would work for you probably not yeah but on those the cartridge connectors it's actually in between the, con the contacts yep right like yep. you were saying on yep. the expansion connector in. right on the expansion connector it's actually takes a connection slot yep right yep. for the key that's right that's right okay thank you everybody and we'll see you awesome. in awesome time three weeks three weeks yeah yes and yes. I'll see you on the um, chat, and I yes. guess in, in the meantime. All right. All right. Bye, guys. Right. Thanks, everyone. Bye.